So today I'm going to do something that uh, I have not done before as we continue to expand this outward. Um, one of the benefits of being packed at the NFL is that you've got NFL on the end and I can do whatever I want. Um, you will not see any MLB or NBA, but that's fine because I don't watch that anyways. Um, but I am going to give my week one predictions this week. Um, it is going to help with quite a lot of things. I mean, it helps, obviously, as you can see right in this region here. I've got a Packers podcast, and I talk about a lot of other teams, and actually understanding those teams is important, as well as one of the cores of what I do on this channel, which is NFL draft-type content. It's really impossible to do NFL draft stuff, especially mock drafts, without having a really good understanding of these teams. So this kind of forces me to really look at these teams and address things. And also one of the benefits is I say stuff, and then you guys correct me, most of which is just kind of people yipping and yapping about my team's better than you say, and I don't care about that. But if there's actual substantive things that I missed, please let me know in the comment section um, because I do want to do want to learn about these teams because unlike a lot of other people as you've probably heard me say before I don't pretend to know your team better than you do um, I am definitely less biased than you are about your team but um, I do want to be able to learn a little bit more so we're venturing out into that realm um, also there's the, the caveat I'll throw myself a bone here and say it's week one so I'm not really worried about getting a lot of this wrong but um, we're gonna do that I also want to say that I am sorry for missing a bunch of, of time this is my first video in quite a while it's uh, it's my daughter's fault. So we uh, we just welcomed Brinley into the family, and there were some complications. We were there longer than expected, and then trying to get caught up on sleep has been somewhat of a problem. So blah blah blah, excuses excuses. We're finally back, and uh, we're going to keep this thing rolling. I was going to kind of do like one game at a time, but I'm just going to do one big video. We'll play with the format as we go along. I'm I'm kind of winging it here, but uh, let's get it started with Thursday night football. So I want to do as good of a job of being um, concise as possible so we can get through all these games in a reasonable amount of time. Um, if you want a little bit more of a long-winded um, thought process behind this, check out the Packernet podcast. I did, toward the end, the second half or whatever of the show, kind of give a little bit more of a long-winded thing. But ultimately, in this game, what it comes down to, I, I genuinely have concerns about both teams and their defenses. And I know that's kind of a touchy thing with, with Chiefs fans and, and general conventional wisdom about the Kansas City Chiefs defense because they you know what were they ninth in points or something allowed um it's hard to reconcile in my brain and i'm not really willing to fight that one to the death right now but i do think there are concerns ultimately what this comes down to and, and we got to leave out the caveat about this is week one anything can happen because that's true for everybody and it just kind of cancels everything out so i'm just looking at it for what it is i i see two offenses that are much better than the opposing defenses um the problem is with the Kansas City Chiefs, first of all, they're, the gap between the the talent on offense and the lack of talent on defense is wider when we talk about the Chiefs offense and the Texans defense. I, I think I like the Chiefs defense a little bit more. J.J. Watt is probably the most talented of anybody on the defense, but um, I will take the Chiefs defense slightly more as well as the Chiefs offense, obviously, quite a bit more. So again, that gap is much wider but the other real big thing here and and I'm willing to give the Texans an opportunity um, to see if they can kind of improve their their offense or, or at least give their GM their head coach an opportunity to let this play out his vision or whatever where essentially we got rid of our number one elite guy brought in three decent wide receivers with Fuller Cobb and Cooks we brought in Johnson at the running back spot we've got Laramie Tunsil going into year two we've got a couple second year guys along the offensive line so I'm willing to let this develop but the problem is week one against the Chief is not is not the time in which I expect that to really take hold, right? Watson learning to to utilize Cobb and Cooks in this offense and, and kind of spread the ball out a little bit more than he had in the past. And and the, the team in general getting this run game going and, and guys like Sharping or whatever going into their second year and being able to kind of blossom if that's ever going to happen again I don't think week one with no preseason is the time and that's going to be a recurring theme with a lot of these picks I think the Chiefs are too much of a powerhouse and as much as maybe long term we can have a conversation about having concerns about where this, this the Chiefs are headed with whatever we don't really need to go down that road right now but um I think again zooming back into Thursday night football no preseason no real opportunity to train for these kinds of things I think the Chiefs win and I, I tend to think it's somewhat comfortably so for the next game I've got the Atlanta Falcons and the Seattle Seahawks no real particular order here other than that's how ESPN has it laid out um, similar to the Kansas City Chiefs and the Houston Texans 
I want to try to make it as close as possible in my mind, and I do think there is a path to victory. I'll tip my hand here to the for the Atlanta Falcons. Um, if you look at, for example, the Atlanta Falcons on off, let, let, let me just give you my premise first of all, and Falcons fans can, you know, critique it from there. But I feel like the Falcons and Packers were on a similar trajectory in which both teams just sort of just broke, just out of nowhere, like that the. the the roster is still not that terrible. There's some identifiable problems, but it shouldn't be that bad. But they just broke. And the Packers and Falcons went in different directions. The Pack Packers went out and just broke it down and rebuilt. New defensive coordinator, new GM, new head coach, new every went out and got a bunch of free agents, just rebuilt this thing from the ground up. They went 13-3. and three. The Falcons said, no, nah, let's just forge ahead. I know there's some changes here and there, but more or less, let's just forge ahead. And they're not going anywhere. And in my mind, it's something's just broke, like fundamentally broke. Could be wrong, but that's my opinion. And so I don't have a high opinion of the Falcons until they address the deeper issues and not just trying to gloss over it with, let's throw in a, I don't know, a tackle or something. So that's where I'm starting from. However, um, throwing out that theory just for a moment, just looking at the pieces for the Atlanta Falcons, I can see somewhat of a path. The, the, the Seattle Seahawks are similar in which they've, been eroding for quite a while and I'm actually I'm pretty critical of the Seattle Seahawks not because I'd necessarily dislike them but I'm just upset with what your GM has done over there and his lack of ability to bring any talent here and people just leave and leave and leave and leave and leave and nobody gets replaced and now you've got a quarterback just sitting there out there on an island and they're still making it work but it's just going to keep getting worse however with the addition of Dunbar and Adams I feel like you know it's kind of a little it's a blip Right? I, it's going to continue down because you can't just pay big money to guys and that's going to be a, a fix-all. That's that's the sign of a – it's a death rattle. It's not going to be a good plan long term. But for this year, I, I think it's going to be a fantastic addition. I think you guys are going to be a very good and formidable team to play. And for that reason, I, I do think that you're going to um, have, a, have a decent enough year. But I see a path for the Atlanta Falcons here insofar as – being able to run the ball, can you run Gurley or not? And and the fact that there's been no preseason, again, going to bang that drum quite a bit, is is worrying me a little bit. I've granted, running back, it's not the, the hardest to acclimate, acclimate kind of a job. But you still got Matthews, you've got Mack, um, Lindstrom is not terrible and he's going into year two. You've got Caleb McGarry going into year two. Hopefully he can kind of improve. He had a rough year at, um, at tackle. James Carpenter I have no hope for whatsoever. But I do think it's it's... Again, the Seattle Seahawks have been eroding, and, and Puna Ford is, is iffy, right? He had a good rookie year, and I don't know so much about year two, but he's got some talent. And then you still got Wagner at the middle linebacker spot, and then you've got, of course, Adams, and, and you did bring in Diggs, who are pretty solid at the safety position, who can all kind of come in on top of Brooks, who you drafted. I don't really care about that because it was a first-round draft pick by your GM who doesn't know what the heck he's doing, so I'm sure he's going to be terrible, so I'm just not worried about that. But still... You look at Irvin and Reed and Green and Wright, and it's just it seems like something that you can possibly attack, including Puna Ford, who, who, if he doesn't have a bounce back year, I think there's some softness. And when you look at, again, Matthews and Mack and Lindstrom and Gurley, who is a talented guy, and although Hurst is the focal point of as far as additions, and I think he can be a big part of what this team does and attacking the defense and whatnot, I think Stocker is a guy that you want to keep an eye on if the plan is to really – run the ball better, which is important for the Atlanta Falcons. Stalker, although not very talented, is a really, really impressive run blocker. So you've got that dynamic of Stalker helping in the run game. You've got Hurst being able to attack the linebackers and safeties, or at least draw attention away. Um, and of course, Julio and Ridley are going to do their thing, which is not going to be easy. Griffin and Dunbar, really, really solid duo. Again, these additions are going to make a big difference. So I can see a path. So that's, it's, it's, it's almost like a stalemate in my mind. The problem comes in when we talk about the Seattle Seahawks offense going up against the Atlanta Falcons defense. And unless there is some kind of a superhuman effort by Grady Jarrett, I just don't really see a path. Obviously, the Seahawks offensive line is terrible, but it's been terrible since forever, and they always manage. And they've gone up against much better defensive fronts than just Grady Jarrett. In fact, they've gone up against Grady Jarrett in the past. Um... Now, he can absolutely wreak havoc, but I think with Russell Wilson and his mobility and whatnot, um, and, and also the the plan to possibly run the ball quite a bit wouldn't be the worst plan in the world. Grady Jarrett is solid enough, but outside of that, I don't know so much. Um, Deion Jones is a good line linebacker, but he's mostly a coverage guy. 
Uh, the safeties offer nothing in my opinion. But if you don't want to do that, you can attack their corners because Oliver has shown nothing. Terrell is a, is a rookie. Denard is decent enough, but I think if you have a three wide set with Dorsett and Metcalf and Lockett in the slot, Lockett's going to rip his face off. So again, there's a path, but it's almost one of those things where the Atlanta Falcons have to have to have everything line up just right in order to win. If they don't knock down all the pins, Seattle wins. So for that reason, I'm going to go with the Seattle Seahawks. I know I said I wasn't going to be as long-winded, but it is what it is. I'm, I'm, I'm taking Seattle on the road, um, and I think it's going to be their first of quite a few wins this season. So next is the Jets and the Bills. Um, I know everyone's just kind of laughing about how ridiculous this is. And I'm probably just going to make a fool of myself, but I, I just, I don't really understand the Bills. And I'm not saying I, I, I don't understand the Bills hype. I get the Bills hype. They went to the playoffs. They have one of the, the best, statistically, one of the best defenses in football. I'm just, I'm just stuck on it, man. I'm just, I don't really get it. For example, Jets offense versus Bills defense, right? And I know Darnold has struggled. Um, he hasn't been all that impressive, but Le'Veon Bell... He didn't do much last year, and I get that. But with an improved offensive line and hopefully a commitment to Bell, although I know there's talk about maybe they're not even going to use him, whatever. Again, I'm going to pick the Buffalo Bills because the Jets are the Jets, right? It's the same thing when you look at the the Browns and the Lions. It's like, yeah, but it's the Browns and the Lions. Are you really going to? All right, fair, fair enough. But setting that aside, week one, anything can happen. Just comparing the rosters, Le'Veon Bell, you added Mekhi Becton. Mekhi Becton. Um, I mean, the, the entire offensive line, for the most part, is is overhauled. It, maybe not necessarily for the better. I know Fant is, is horrible. But McGovern is a pretty solid center. Um, and then you look at the wide receivers. I really like Rashad Perriman. I know nobody cares about Rashad Perriman. He's had two solid years. He was a number three in Tampa. But he's basically a really legit number two on pretty much every other team based on his production. Speedster, all that stuff. You still got Crowder. There, there's potential here for this to actually work. It all centers around, again, the Jets not being ridiculously horrible in terms of coaching, play calling, all that stuff. But also Darnold. And let's not pretend the Buffalo Bills have a good quarterback either. But if Darnold can kind of take a step, and hopefully he'll get some help by getting a competent running back and a, a solid enough offensive line and a couple wide receivers for the first time ever in his career, maybe that can turn around. And then I look at, yeah, but it's the Bills' defense, which is, you know, the best in the NFL or whatever. I can't argue with the stats. I just don't understand it. Tredavious White, solid. Micah Hyde, solid. Poyer at safety, solid. Hughes and Murphy, Okay, fair enough. They're 900 years old, but they seem decent. Um, you know, PFF-wise, Hughes was 30th and Murphy was 26th. That's not terrible. Um, Ed Oliver didn't do much of anything. Addison provides nothing at defensive tackle. I, I got completely obliterated, um, not correctly, by the way, but for saying the Buffalo Bills linebackers are not that good. Tremaine Edmonds, what is he good at? Stopping the run? He was ranked 23rd against the run and a hundred... Or, uh, what was it? Uh, yeah, 23rd against the run. I don't know. Not good. Oh, coverage is the other thing I was looking at. 54th. He can't do it. So, and then you look at Josh Norman, who's not only injured, he's just not a good football player. I don't know why the guy keeps getting paid. He had one good year in 2015, got a ton of money, played like garbage, is getting a bunch more money to be a 32-year-old guy that doesn't know how to play football, and now he's hurt. You got Teron Johnson, who was a fourth-round pick. I don't expect anything out of him. And... and uh, I don't know. I don't want to trash the Bills because I think they're probably going to win this game. But I, I'm not counting out the Jets. I, I'm picking the Bills, but I don't necessarily know that 400-year-old Hughes is going to tee off on Mekhi Becton. Um, I don't know that that's the case. And again, if, if Bell does a better job and Perriman and Crowder and the offensive line and Darnold and all this stuff improves, I don't think it's impossible that they can get some yardage against Johnson and Norman at corner or against Edmonds or Klein or whoever your linebackers are going to be I just don't think that that's going to be that big of a problem um, and then on the flip side the Buffalo Bills offense I'm not overly impressed I know Stephon Diggs is a, a real big addition but um, you know Josh Allen is not Kirk Cousins he's just not he can't hit the broad side of a barn he's got a, he's got a cannon he can launch it 400 yards but he can't hit anything so what good is that um, the offensive line, I, I think, is, is more or less terrible. You've got uh, Cody Ford, who maybe is going to take a step. If he doesn't, he's 
horrific. You got Brian Winters, you got Mitch Morse, you got uh, Quentin Spain. None of these guys can do anything. The only guy worth anything is Deion Dawkins off the left side. I'll acknowledge that there isn't much by way of the Jets' defense, and if Marcus May doesn't play, I know he's injured, then then there's just nothing, and this is how they win. The Buffalo Bills, with their not very good offense, one of the worst in football, is able to move against the Jets' defense that doesn't have very much. But I don't know that the Jets' defense is all that much worse than... I shouldn't even say that because people are going to destroy me, but just, just looking at the pieces. Looking at the pieces. you got Jenkins and Basham. You got Austin on the outside, and you got Desir, who's not good. But again, Buffalo has guys that aren't good either. I, I don't know, man. I'm not counting out the Jets. That's all I'm going to say. I think the Buffalo Bills are going to win, but I don't necessarily think the Buffalo Bills are that good. I think they're wildly overrated. I just don't think they have a very good football team. I'm going to leave it at that. So next up, we got Detroit and Chicago. I was expecting to give kind of a, uh, a long shot here. But I guess the Lions are actually favorited. There, there are three-point favorites in this game. Um, but anyways, uh, my, my general thought is that you've got the caveat that the Lions are the Lions. Um, and clearly this is not a very definitive thing in my mind. Um, the Chicago Bears defense is for real. I've had my reservations. I've taken digs at the Bears defense. I predicted that they would regress which they did last year, um, largely because a lot of the players that did really, really well have never done that before. So there's no reason to expect them to stay at that level forever, and they didn't. Um, I don't think Will Fuller is very good, and he kind of showed that pretty much every year of his career, with the exception of 2017-2018 under Vic Fangio, and with this change of scheme away from the more zone-heavy and moving toward a more man-coverage-centric thing, he had one of his worst years basically since his rookie year. Bears fans will argue with me, but it is what it is. Um, the fact that he is going to have to go up against Kenny Galladay, I think Kenny Galladay is going to absolutely rip his face off. Jalen Johnson was a second-round pick, but there's no reason to think he's going to come in with no no training camp. No, I mean, There is a little bit of training camp, but no... Uh, you know what I'm trying to say, the preseason. Buster Screen is and always has been terrible. The linebackers, I'm, I'm going to... I, I, when I watch the linebackers, I like their linebackers, and I know everybody else likes their linebackers, but I, I will just throw out the caveat. PFF thinks your linebackers are trash. It is what it is. Roquan, in particular, they had ranked 67th out of 90th, basically saying he's no good at anything and that he actually regressed from 2018 to 2019, which shouldn't be that surprising because everybody did. Danny Trevathan, likewise, uh, PFF has liked him in the past but said he was not very good in 2019, which at 30 years old may just be a sign of him not doing much. And then the biggest sort of stab at the Bears would be Eddie Jackson, um, seen as one of the best safeties in football. I see Eddie Jackson as a guy like a lot of other people that had one really good year, got a bunch of money. Everybody in the media still hangs on to the fact that he's still a really good safety, despite the fact that he's not the same guy he was in 2018. Um, not saying necessarily that he's terrible, but he's playing more like a fourth round safety that's good, not great, that... Um, you know, whatever. But it's still it's still a very good defense, especially the front. I think Robert Quinn is actually underrated um, in terms of his ability to get to the quarterback. I think he still does that at a very high level, and the fact that Khalil Mack is still on the other side um, or is now on the other side is going to mean that Robert Quinn has probably got the best scenario he's ever had. Akeem Hicks in the middle, um, you know, like everybody else, he had sort of a standout year in 2018 which once that happened, everybody started talking about how Akeem Hicks is underrated. He's one of the greatest ever because that's what media pundits do. Um, the fact is, he's good. He's He is really good. He's not what he was in 2018. That was somewhat of a fluke. Um, but still, that front is going to be kind of scary. Um, the question is, though, is that going to be enough to stop Stafford, um, primarily considering they're going to be throwing the ball a lot, and they have a pretty solid offensive line. They lost Wagner at right tackle, but they replaced him with uh, Halapalavati Vaitai, I just like saying it, who I think is probably a better player and he's younger and everything else. They went out and got uh, Jonah Jackson in the third round to come in at guard. They still got Ragnow at center. They got Decker at left tackle. It's still a pretty solid offensive line. Hawkinson's going into his second year. The bottom line is, as good as this front is, if the offensive line can hold up, I just think they throw all over them. I think Galladay, Amendola, and Jones are going to rip this, this team to shreds. Um... More or less, you know, the, the defensive front is still going to have its way a little bit, but I think Stafford is going to come out slinging it. Um, they don't have a lot of, of youth outside of Swift, 
that they need to really worry about. And, you know, Jackson, assuming he is the starting right guard, I don't really know for sure. But I, I, I give advantage uh, Detroit as far as that's concerned. And then, of course, the other real big issue, outside of the fact that the Lions' defense is a, um, I guess, a point of weakness, um, the Bears' offense is not the group to take advantage of it. you got Jeff Okuda. You've got Trufant, who I think is underrated. He's a, a solid enough, not elite, but a solid enough, especially if Okuda is even half as good as his billing. If you've got Trufant as your number two instead of being the, his number one, which he has been for a long time, um, Flowers is a really solid pass rusher. I know he didn't have quite the impact that a lot of people thought, but again, if you look at his pressure rate, his ability to get to the quarterback when he's asked to do so, he does it at a very high rate. Um, lots of concerns in the middle of this defense. The defensive line and the linebackers are just horrific, depending on where Collins plays. He's kind of an edge linebacker hybrid, which is an unusual type of hybrid, but that's what he is. Um, depending on where he lines up, that will change slightly, but more or less, this is a team that's going to have a hard time stopping the run, but I don't think the Bears are going to be able to capitalize on that. Um, I don't even know if Montgomery is playing. I heard there was some uh, real positive news in terms of his ability to possibly come out and play but even if he does you know again we're talking week one the offensive line has been regressing for a long time I just don't see Trubisky who there's been no positive reports coming out I mean the, the listen the best case scenario for the Bears was that Nick Foles comes in Nick Foles plays he's a solid enough um, game manager who's able to distribute the ball to Miller and to Robinson and to Ginn and to Komet and Jimmy Graham and you get Tariq Cohen mixed in and you get the run game going and you just get this thing that's a good enough, well enough oiled machine similar to what the Jaguars had when they nearly won the Super Bowl with this defense that's that's good, that is a good defense. Again, when, when I say that they're overrated, I'm kind of just talking about the media says this is like the number one person. They are very good, but they're not They're not that. I'm not saying they're bad. Um, talking largely about Eddie Jackson. Fuller, I do think, is, is teetering on bad. Um, but I, I just don't see, like, what what is the strategy? What is the game plan? How do we beat the Lions? And I think the best way to do that would be to attack with your tight ends and your run game. And I don't know that you're going to have any of that ready to go. I know there's been a lot of positive reports about Jimmy Graham, but I don't buy that. There were positive reports about Jimmy Graham and Aaron Rodgers tearing it up in camp, too. How well did that work out? It didn't. It should terrify you that Jimmy Graham has been the highlight of your camp. That's terrible. Um, it, you know, and on top of that, you could say, well, maybe Jelani Tavai takes a step. Also, I think the Lions have some pretty solid safeties that are somewhat under the radar. Again, there's a path to victory. Solid defensive effort to shut down the Lions' offense, especially early on when they can't get into a rhythm or whatever, and then you do just enough on offense to win. But again, I think the, the the more clear path to victory goes to the Detroit Lions. I do see it as a close game, but I do think the Lions come out swinging and come out on top of this one. Next, we got the Packers and the Vikings. Obviously, this is uh, a Packers-centric thing, so I'm going to give the abbreviated version as best as I possibly can. If you want more, I'm planning on doing actually, well, I'll probably actually do a, a Packers and Vikings podcast as well as a Packers and Vikings YouTube thing on Sunday just to do a more in-depth look at it. But look, I, I just, and, and Vikings fans have been real, real hot on this whole situation and, and on this this matchup and they're real and I'm, I'm trying to be honest about it and I'm trying to, to see their side of it I just don't really see it let me give you credit where it's due Kirk Cousins had a phenomenal year last year um, Dalvin Cook is a good running back Adam Thielen is a good wide receiver I think you guys are wildly over inflating your tight ends I've seen a couple comparisons between Packers and Vikings tight ends and, and granted your tight ends, I would say, are probably going to be better, you know, because we got a bunch of young guys. We have no idea, you know, is, is Sternberger going to – I don't know. But you don't have good tight ends. Kyle Rudolph is old and decrepit, and Smith has done nothing. Um, Reef is fine, I guess. O'Neal is fine, not great. Um, defensively is where it gets real ugly and where I'm going to really upset a lot of you guys. But, I mean, Yannick, I've already done a whole video on Yannick. He's fine. He's good, and, and assuming we're just talking about rushing the passer because he's literally one of the worst run-defending edge rushers in all of football. Um, but he's not as good as, as being made out. That's what. Listen, try not to stretch this out too much. 
if if the stats that are pointing to how good he is are a bunch of unnecessary qualifiers like when the team is up by seven since 2016 when the guy has a left glove and not a right glove and is looking cross-eyed and puts his head you know it's just when you add all these stupid things that don't matter so that you could try to bump him up rather than just saying here's the stats for last year and he's the best it kind of goes to show that they're just trying to twist stats to make him look better than he is. It's probably why he took $12 million to come there. And no, he didn't take a massive pay cut because he just loves the Vikings so much he'll do anything for them. That's stupid. Um, so the defensive front is a, is kind of a disaster right now. Odenabo is at about 9% pressure percentage, which is not good. Anything under 10 is pretty terrible. And Gakwe is in more of the 12% range, which is fine. Again, decent enough pass rusher, but run, stopping the run is a problem. Um, Kendricks is Kendricks and Barr are both unbelievably overrated. Uh, Kendricks had an elite year last year. It was his first year ever doing that, ever. And Barr has, I don't think, ever done that. He was very good, like, in 2015 or something. Um, but you have probably the best safety duo in football. I, I just, I don't see what is so fantastic about this. You, you don't have corners. So as much as there's, well, what are you going to do? You don't have any wide receivers. Dude, we had a four-game stretch with no Devontae Adams and went 4-0. and And you think by not having corners, it's fine because we just have one of the top wide receivers in football and Alan Lazard, who is a fine at number two he was rated 58th out of 122 if you figure there's 32 teams that would be from 33 to 64 would be sort of that number two range he was 58th so he's right in that number two wide receiver range he's he's par for the course as far as number twos go and if you want to go on a tirade about number twos let's talk about um the heck is it got ola bc johnson okay um and also you're talking about jair alexander kevin king compared to what hill and hughes is hughes even playing i don't know and you got a bunch of rookies i'm 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 rambling a bit but there, there's just no path to victory okay so packers off how are they possibly going to beat this defense well we could run the ball against your defense that has no ability to stop the run i mean you weren't even that good at it last year when aaron jones ripped your face off and that's when you had um daniel hunter and you had everson griffin and you had linval joseph all three of which are gone replaced with the worst run defending edge rusher in football so best of luck stopping that on top of being the second year in a system with a head coach that likes to really drill running the football last year they didn't quite really get it yet this is year two in that system of running the ball a lot more um so best of luck with that. Devontae Adams is going to be stopped by who again? Uh, uh -huh. Nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing you can do to stop the offense. And, and we're talking about a team that beat you twice last year. So defensively, there's nothing that this team can do to stop the Packers. Um, on the flip side, you've got a chance, again, but you lost Stephon Diggs. So your number two wide receiver has to become your number one wide receiver. Ola B.C. Johnson is a ridiculous drop-off in talent. Well, we got Justin Jefferson. Right. You have Justin Jefferson, who's good at one thing, which is beating guys off the line of scrimmage. I've watched lots and lots of his college tape because it was t tons of talk about him going to Green Bay. I was a big fan, but the more I watched him, the more I realized this guy does one thing. He does one thing. He never wins down the field. He doesn't even try to go down the field. He's quick off the line, similar to Devontae, except if Devontae was just a one-trick pony, had no ability to do anything else, like win down the field, which he does. Which is why they're relegating him to the slot, and he can't even beat all of B.C. Johnson as far as being an outside wide receiver. By the way, you guys play a lot of 12 personnel, meaning um, two wide receivers. So that guy might not even be on the field very much. Dalvin Cook running behind this terrible offensive line, who is going to have to stop Smith and Smith again and Kenny Clark. I mean, there's there's holes on the defense, but but so what? There's just no question in my mind the better team. There's no question in my mind. What What is the path to victory? You're going to run all over the Packers, what, like you did last time? Dalvin Cook did not have a good outing. Well, if you look at his yards per carry, right. Look at the first game they played, because he had like a 70-yard scamper. Subtract out like his two good runs in that game, and he basically went nowhere the whole game. Go watch it. He couldn't do anything against this defense. So you didn't get better on, on offense, you got worse. You didn't get better on defense, you got worse. The Packers, at, at worst, stayed the same. How in the world are we even coming to the conclusion that the Vikings might win this game? I don't, I don't have a clue. 
How, how could you come to that conclusion when one team gets a lot worse, the other team at worst stays the same, and yet we've got the Vikings two and a half point favorites? Brain damage. It's just, it's brain damage is all I can come up with. I mean, the, what what is the logic behind it? What is different this year that's going to make it a different outcome than last year? Best of luck. <laughs> Clearly failing in my mission to be nice. Sorry. Next up is the Patriots and the Miami Dolphins. And, I, you know, clearly we've seen the Patriots sort of dissolve. Um, large por portion, mind is just going, large portion of the defense um, is, is missing this year. Obviously, Tom Brady, who was... Uh, key component is is the wrong way to even say it because he was he was the identity of that team largely maybe not last year where the defense kind of held the team down but with him being gone obviously nothing's the same however as much as I do expect the Patriots to struggle a lot I'm just not buying the Miami Dolphins hype um I love that Miami Dolphins fans are jacked up and I hope they do well I have no ill will toward them but even when you ask Miami Dolphins fans, and I did in the Facebook group, um, you know, what is it that's going to help your team win? A lot of them say it's Flores. It's our coach. I don't want to dog your coach, but I just, I, from the outside looking in, what in the heck am I supposed to get excited about that guy for? We've got the longtime defensive coordinator taking over for Detroit, and he's a joke. But the guy that was his backup, the linebackers coach, that was never even handed the job of defensive coordinator. I think he was... He was the like defensive coordinator that never even got the title of defensive coordinator and then got shipped off to Miami. So you've got a guy with, with not even defensive coordinator experience who is now a head coach of a group of not very good football players. I, I can't really get excited about it. Now, long term, maybe. I, I don't have any reason to dislike him. You guys think he's great. Must be doing a great job at the locker room. Cool, right? The the whole rebuild process, I'm excited about it. If you look at trajectory, this is kind of the wrong thing to do, but this is kind of what we're looking at. It's it's actually like this, but that's hard to do with my hands. You know, the Patriots are going like this. The Dolphins are assuming they navigate things properly. There's no guarantee you're going up, but they probably are. But at this point in time, you know, I think despite the fact that the defense has eroded, we're still looking at McCordy and Gilmore. Um, Winovich is still there. Um, there's not a whole lot else. I think uh, J.C. Jackson is decent enough. I'm assuming he's going to be one of the, the primary guys on the outside. Um, I think that might be enough to kind of hold it down. I don't know what they're going to be able to do. I mean, you got Parker. You've got an offensive line that is at best unproven. You know, you've got Austin Jackson. Maybe he's going to be good. Maybe he's not. You got Solomon Kindley or Kindly, whatever his name is. You got uh, Ted Karras, who's not very good. You got uh, Eric Flowers, who's never been any good at anything. Gesicki might be good. There was a lot of hype, but he hasn't done anything. You got Smythe, not very good at all. Um, again, maybe. And I don't even know if it's Fitzpatrick or Tua. I, I would have assumed it's Tua, but I'm looking at Fitzpatrick. Just time out. So our lads, as well as PFF, have Ryan Fitzpatrick as the starter. I mean, it's, you know, again, if, if I'm going to get excited, it's the same thing I said with the Bears. If I'm going to get excited, it's going to be the hype about this new guy coming in. And if it's not Tua, then it's Ryan's, Ryan Fitzpatrick. And, you know, we can play the whole Fitz magic game and everything, but he's got nobody around him. Jordan Howard is fine, but he's not going to transform this thing. Neither is Matt Breida or any of these guys. So I just, you know, again, New England's defense isn't what it is, but we're talking about a great defensive mind who is the head coach of the New England Patriots still at the helm of this defense has, you know, I, I shouldn't say he's got a track record of beating Miami because it's actually the opposite in terms of whatever. But even if you look at the other side of this, I am the biggest Raekwon Davis fan on planet Earth. I've made multiple videos of Raekwon Davis. I've just got a weird thing. Um, but he's a, a pure run defender, and he's going to be playing nose tackle. If you look at Godshaw, or however you say that French name, he's meh, kind of, you know, but again... He's a run defender. You look at Manny Wilkins. Hopefully he takes a step. Hopefully he gets better. Either way, he was better against the run than he was against the pass. You've got Kyle Van Noy, who came in from New England. Um, 
probably has somewhat of an upper hand playing against New England, but what is he really good at more than the other thing? It, it's, it's against the run. You look at Emmanuel Ogba. He's more of a run defender than a pass rusher. I'm not seeing a lot of real good pass rush here. Linebackers are putrid. The uh, safeties are putrid. You look at the corners. What do you have at corner? I, I mean, you've got Byron Jones. That's cool. That was a, a good addition. Maybe. There's no guarantee he's going to come over and be able to play that way. We, how many times have we seen free agents come over and they just can't hang? On top of Xavier Howard, who, outside of a good 2018 season, hasn't done much. So even if I'm, I'm not excited about Cam Newton, I respect the Patriots' offensive line. If Cam Newton even gets back to, I mean... I can't judge him based on 2019 when he was injured, and he's 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 always been at least good enough to navigate, and with his running ability and everything, and he's he's got experience. You know, again, even if I'm not saying he's okay, so he's not top 10, maybe he's not even top 15, but he can beat this defense. What are we looking at here? There's nothing here. So, again, I, I there's a lot of hype for Miami, and I just don't get it. I don't like your defense. I don't like your offense. You've got one good, not great corner. You got Van Noy, who's decent enough, I guess. That's it. I don't like your other corner. I don't like the rest of your defensive line. I don't like Agba. I don't like your linebackers. I don't like your safeties. Um, let's see. I don't like your offensive line. I don't like your tight ends. I don't really like anybody outside of Parker. And Parker's as far as number one wide receivers go. Jordan Howard is mm, and Fitzpatrick is. Mm. I, you know, I'm 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 missing it. I'm missing the train on the on the Miami Dolphins hype. If somebody wants to jump in and tell me why everyone's excited about them being this great team. Again, long-term vision, fine, um, but I'm looking at a team that is the New England Patriots that I don't care for, and I don't think they're going to do very well this year. I think they beat Miami. We'll see. We'll see. I, I, you know, but there's nothing I can go off of here that, that says Miami wins, so I'm going to go with New England in a very boring game. Next up, we've got Washington and Philly. This one, I don't really feel a lot of heartburn about giving my prediction or about people being mad at me because I feel like even Washington fans have to know, right? I mean, you guys, I don't know. You, you got to know, right? So it, if we're to build a, a path to Washington winning this game, it, it's entirely around Haskins taking a real big jump. If he does that, which is unlikely because you've got a guy that didn't perform very well, doesn't have a very good offensive line, and outside of McLaurin, who's helping him? He's got no run game, he's got no tight ends, he's got no other wide receivers. It doesn't bode well for him taking a big step. But let's pretend that it wasn't a dysfunctional organization and everything else that I said wasn't the case. If Haskins takes a step... Um, I don't like the Eagles' corners, and I've said that several times. I know you got Darius Slay. He had a terrible year last year. Um, he was graded 85th out of 115 cornerbacks. Um, and even before that, he's good. He's not elite, like like a, a lot of people have said that he was. I think it, it, the year before that, he was 23rd, which, again, is good, but it's low-end number one corner. Um, but anyway, so the corners aren't great. So you got an opportunity if Haskins like just blows up this year to be able to distribute the ball to, to somebody, McLaurin, obviously, and then hopefully a couple other guys. Um, running the ball, I think, is going to be nearly impossible. The, the defensive front of Philadelphia is too stout, and you don't have a running back or an offensive line. Um, so I just I don't really see a path. And, and just beyond that, the ability to rush the passer, I just think Haskins is going to be under duress the whole time. And then to make matters even worse, when you flip the field around outside of Chase Young, who hopefully can have some kind of an impact, there's nothing, right? I mean, you've got this this entire Alabama defense with Allen and Payne and whoever else that they've got. Um, Collins, who's there, who was massively overrated. They massively overpaid him. That was a stupid move. I don't know why they did that. I know it was the hype of everybody. Oh, man, he's the greatest safety in, in free agency market. I don't think he even was. He got paid like he's 10 times better than everybody, and he's absolutely not. I, I'm assuming you guys have figured that out by now. I don't know why anybody bought into that hype. But anyways... So you got Collins, who's okay, I guess. Um, but, I mean, you've got Goddard. You've got Ertz. Um, you've got Miles Sanders at running back. you got Jackson. I don't know if Rager is going to be playing, but you got him. you got Whiteside, who, you know, whatever he's worth. It doesn't matter. They don't need much. If they can just run the ball well, which they will behind this offensive line, and, again, even with Chase Young, he's going up against, what, Peters and Johnson? It's just 
Okay, so he gets a couple, right? What is that going to do? Your offense can't pass. Your offense can't run. Your defense can't stop the pass. Your defense can't stop the run. We'll run away from Chase Young. You get one or two sacks. It's just, it's not going to do anything. Um, I think Washington is in on, uh, you know, number one overall pick watch for sure. We'll have to see how that lands, but it, there's, there's really just nothing here that I like. Um, you got Young, which is a good building piece for the future, but, you know, and I, I hate to dog you to your rivals and whatnot, but it just is what it is. It's not your time. Eagles do have quite a bit to prove. I don't know that they're necessarily going to be a good team. I, I like their roster. I like your guys' roster and all, but obviously last year was not good enough. We'll see if you can live up to the potential, but Washington should not be a problem. And if it is, you know, if there's some kind of week one issue, that's problematic because this is probably the easiest game you're going to play all year aside from the next time you play them, obviously. But this is going to Philly. Next up, Raiders and Carolina Panthers. I, I my Again, I, I kind of want to just give my vision of these teams. I feel like the Panthers are on a similar trajectory as the Rams, but they're a little bit behind them. The Rams, when when um, Gruden came in, just ripped it apart and is rebuilding it. And I actually kind of respect what they're doing. I know they've been kind of a laughing stock, and Gruden is seen as a laughing stock and all that. But um, I think they overperformed last year, which was impressive. Obviously, it was a, a good start, and then they fell off. But still, they, they shouldn't have done as well as they did early on, um, considering I just thought they had a, a completely useless roster from basically top to bottom. Um, but they've added a few pieces. We'll see what guys like Cleveland Furl can do. Um, as they come around the for the second year, Max Crosby as well. They've added guys like Arnett. Um, if we stick with the defense for a minute while we're here, this is kind of where I would say it's closest to 50-50. You've got a path to victory for the Carolina Panthers. And, and clearly there's a lot of hype and all that stuff about the, the build and everything that they've done. But again, I think they're behind the Raiders in that they're just starting this process of, of rebuilding and kind of getting the vision. I don't even think Bridgewater is expected to be the long-term vision. Although I respect Bridgewater, I think he's going to be a real good sort of game manager type. I think he's going to be able to distribute the ball wherever it needs to go. That's fine. Um, but again, this isn't this isn't even the long-term vision of the team. So they're, they're lagging a little bit. Um, but I can see, for example, Moore, I think, is a good enough wide receiver to be able to beat the guys that they have outside. McCaffrey, although the Raiders did go out and get a bunch of linebackers, I think they went out and got three of them. Littleton, obviously, is going to be the guy that you want to watch in terms of being able to cover a guy like McCaffrey, one of the better coverage linebackers in football. Um, but I, I just I don't know. The defensive front is useless unless Cleveland Farrell takes a step. And I know a lot of people like, um, what's his name, uh, Hurst. I, I shouldn't say Hurst. Hurst is not useless. He's he's solid when he's on the field. And I'm assuming that's mostly as a pass rushing uh, defensive tackle, not against the run. Um, but, uh, again, it's we've got Taylor Moten, who's a good tackle. We've got Christian McCaffrey. We've got Anderson, who's decent. we got Samuel, and we got Moore. I think there's enough there to take advantage of this this defense that doesn't really have a lot of pieces. We can't assume our net's going to do anything. Hurst is going to bring a little bit of pressure up the middle. Littleton and Kwiatkowski will do their thing in terms of, you know, maybe bringing a little extra pressure from Kwiatkowski, being able to cover from Littleton, kind of holding it down a little bit. But we've, we've got a shot. I think the real problem is going to come in when we talk about the Raiders' offense versus the Panthers' defense, which is really just a problem. Um, you know, you've got Burns going into a second year. Maybe he takes a step. You got Gross Matos. Maybe he's going to be able to provide something. I, I don't mind your safeties as much, but I think the Raiders have done a really good job focusing on the offensive line. They've done, you know, Miller, Incognito, Hudson, Jackson, Brown. It's a solid group. Waller is a phenomenal tight end who's going to be able to pick apart your linebackers. Um, obviously, one of the best young running backs in the game is a Raider. I think Derek Carr is an underrated quarterback. You, you not only have Ren, Renfro, who did a good job being completely on an island by himself, being the only halfway competent uh, wide receiver, now you bring in uh, Henry Ruggs, who is going to be able to take the top off the defense, tons of speed, the number one guy on this on this team that I don't know who exactly is going to be able to stop that assault uh, as far as the Carolina Panthers, but also you went out and you got Brian Edwards in the third round, so now you've got two additional wide receivers to add to Renfro, Waller, good offensive line, quality, enough quarterback, really solid run. I just, I don't see a path for Carolina to be able to stop the Raiders. I think they're going to ground and pound you to death and, um, you know, just be able to supplement that with just 
whatever they want to do, right? They can hit you wherever. If, if, if you're able to stop Ruggs and his speed down the field, we're going to attack the middle of the field, the short area with Waller, Edwards, Renfro in the slot. That's where it gets dicey, right? So, so again, Carolina Panthers offense maybe can, can handle the Raiders defense to a point, assuming a lot of these Raiders guys don't take a step. But I think, I think this is where the, the scales tip heavily in the Raiders' favor. So I'm going to say the Raiders take this one over the Carolina Panthers, who are, again, just in the early stages of a rebuild. I don't have a problem with the Carolina Panthers. I just think it's, it's early in this process. Next up, we've got the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Indianapolis Colts. And again, I don't have any heartburn about this one. I'm really high on the Indianapolis Colts. Um, I'm maybe not as, as low on the Jaguars. I know a lot of people say they're going to get the first pick. I think Washington is worse. Maybe it has to do with the schedule. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Point is, I like the, the, the Colts. If you Let's just start with Jaguars on offense. Minshew is a solid enough quarterback, but he's got nothing to work with. The offensive line is no good. Tyler Eifert is good for about a game and a half. Um, they don't have a running back. You got DJ Chark and what? The Colts just, I mean, you got Justin Houston, who's still getting it done. They went out and got DeForest Buckner, who's going to rip things apart on the inside. Um, you got Autry, who isn't great, but he's a good enough compliment when you add in these other pieces. You got Okariki, Okariki, Ekereke, whatever his name is, I don't know. But he came in, and in and, and his first year, um, a third-round pick, PFF had him as the ninth-best linebacker in football, next to Leonard in his second year as the eighth-best linebacker in football. Probably one of, I think Leonard is, I, I looked at the linebackers before to see if there were any good two-way linebackers. In other words, they're really good against the run and they're good in coverage. I think Leonard is maybe the only true two-way linebacker, and everybody's going to argue, but that I can see once, uh, what's his name from the Panthers left, he's it, man. I don't know of anybody else that's that's really playing at a high level at both ends. Usually you get guys like Corey Littleton who are really good in coverage, nah, not so much against the run. Um, so the linebackers are dominant. The, the Colts are drafting so well, it's ridiculous. Again, you got the two linebackers that are really, really solid. You, you got them supplementing in free agency with guys like Houston and Buckner who are great additions. But then you got guys like Kenny Moore who's getting better every single year. You got Rocky Sin who... Maybe wasn't as good as you'd hope he'd be, but as a rookie, it's not terrible. Um, he could possibly take a step. You look at, at uh, uh, Kari Willis, solid for a fourth-round pick to come in and, and play and, and do as well as he did. You got Malik Hooker, who, again, not necessarily elite, but good enough. I mean, th these are draft picks that are performing. And so, again, we look at, you know, who is going to stop Houston and, and Buckner? Robinson, Norwell, Linder, Cannon, Taylor? No, nah, man. It's Minshew's going to get ripped up, and they have no ability to run the ball. It's just it's going to be a slaughter. I just think they're going to get absolutely annihilated. I don't know what you even do to move the ball, and we haven't even flipped to the other side yet. This is one of the better offensive lines, especially in terms of road grading. If they wanted to just just to make a statement, just say, you know what, sort of like the 49ers did to the Packers, um, we're just going to run the ball every single play because you can't stop it, and I think it's funny. If they wanted to do that, they probably could. You got Mac and Jonathan Taylor, and, and I think you're going to probably get a heavy dose of Mac, similar to A.J. Dillon in Green Bay, where it's that's probably the future. That's where we're headed. But for now, while they get acclimated, we got a really good guy here in Mac. We're going to run with him. But, I mean, you could just do that, and you'd be fine. Not to mention you can run with Doyle, who's decent enough and probably destroy anybody. That I mean, Miles Jack. I mean, I was a big fan of Miles Jack when he came out. The guy's got nothing left. Um, Schobert isn't going to stop him. You got maybe Leon Jacobs, but I don't think he's going to be able to do it. Seventh round pick. Um, Herndon is no good at corner. You got CJ Henderson, who was a first round pick, maybe. But again, just looking at the, I mean, there's certain teams when you want to just be level across the board. Like either you give credence to rookies or you don't. And, and especially this year, I'm not going to. So Chase on and Henderson. Not so much. But you also look at the teams, right? If the Colts have a first-round pick going out, I'm a little bit more optimistic because they do such a good job drafting. Some teams just suck at it. And I don't know that I can look at the Jaguars and say this is a really... The Jaguars were successful because they went out and got a bunch of free agents. And there's a lot of teams that do that. They try to push all in with a bunch of free agents. Maybe they have a good year, maybe they don't, and then it just all falls apart. Really good teams that are good for a sustained period of time are teams that draft well. If the Jaguars can't figure out how to draft well, 
they're not going to do anything. That's a kind of a side issue, but it, it goes to the point that I don't even think C.J. Henderson is going to really provide all that much. He went earlier than expected anyways, and even if he does, what else is there? He's got nobody else on the other side, so he goes up against what? Is he is, is C.J. Henderson going to stop T.Y. Hilton? I know T.Y. T, T. isn't exactly the, the uh, spring chicken he used to be, but I think Rivers to T.Y. is just going to rip some faces off. That's not to mention you've got Michael Pittman, and you've got... Uh, Paris Campbell, who maybe wasn't as good as you'd hope, but he was injured and everything. I mean, he's now that he's basically the number three slot guy, I think he's got a lot of potential. I'm, I'm way over explaining this because it's obvious, but I, I just, I'm very high on the Colts. I'm very worried about the Packers having to play the Colts because they're terrifying. Um, and I'm kind of excited to see what they do because I just, I just feel like this is a machine that's going to be hard to stop. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. You know, one of the comments about how the Jaguars are going to win is that Rivers is just getting worse and he's going to continue to decline. I think you could put most quarterbacks behind this offensive line with these wide receivers and this these running backs and whatever and put them in this situation and they'd be fine. I think Phillip Rivers is more than adequate to be able to play behind this. And let's not forget that decline that we're seeing was behind probably the worst offensive line in football. So... Sorry, Jaguars fans. I'm going with the Colts in this one. Next up, we've got the Baltimore Ravens and the Cleveland Browns, and I'm very pleased to say this should actually be a pretty solid game. I, don't, I, I might be lying right now. I, I, I don't know that I necessarily believe that. I hope it's a good game because I, I want to buy into the Cleveland Browns being, being a really good team. And again, I want to stay away from the whole, well, it's the Browns, so they're going to be terrible. Entirely possible. But the, the real exciting part is going to be the Cleveland Browns offense against the Baltimore Ravens defense because I kind of respect both of them. Now, again, I'm assuming that the, the Browns can figure this out and they do a much better job offensively, hopefully, with their new um, coaching staff and whatnot. They'll be able to figure that out. They brought in Hooper, who should be able to help. They drafted Wills. I, I really like their offensive line. I think Baker Mayfield is going to do a good job. I like their running backs, obviously. you got Beckham and Landry, which is a great, great wide receiver duo. There's more than enough firepower here at every single level to be able to handle stuff. Now, even at their best, you're going up against a really solid group in Baltimore. Um, you've got Mr. Calais Campbell, now a Baltimore Raven, who is one of the freakiest guys ever. I, I've, I've talked about this several times when I on, on my podcast, and I think in YouTube, I don't know, but this is a guy who... It took until year four before he even had a good year. It took until year five, six, seven until he had a very good year. It was year nine when he had his elite year in 20, or 2016. He's been elite for four straight years. The guy just keeps getting better. He's 34 years old. Um, so he's absolutely dominant. You've got some other guys that are, you know, I don't know that by themselves they're super elite, but they get the job done in this defense like Bowser and Judon and whatnot on top of a really solid cornerback group headed off by Peters. And you got Humphrey, who I was a big fan of coming out of college. He's done a decent enough job. Jimmy Smith, I don't know, I would say he's kind of iffy. But again, in this group, he does a good job. Even losing, um, I'm just, I'm, my brain is just fried. You lost your safety, but you still got Clark and Elliott, who I think are solid enough. He had a real big hole at linebacker. Patrick Queen is going to make a big difference. And I don't mean in, in terms of in a positive sense. I mean, it's going to make a big difference which way this thing goes. If Patrick Queen is a high-impact guy and plays at a level that a lot of people felt like he could, that's going to be massive for this defense in, in terms of taking it to that next level, right? It, whereas if he's really, really bad, then you got a hole and there's some some issues there. And, and there's some probability, right? We've seen a lot of first-round linebackers not really – live up to that billing. He was a late first round guy. Um, there, you know, again, no preseason or any of that kind of stuff. But I think I think this is a good matchup. Browns offense, Baltimore defense. The problem comes in when we look at the other side of this, when we have Baltimore Ravens on offense and the Browns on defense, because I'm just not a big fan of the Cleveland Browns defense. I know you've got Miles Garrett and Olivier Vernon, and I think Olivier Vernon is underrated. I think he's a solid pass rusher. Um, I just I don't like much else about this defense. The other thing that I'm worried about is you have, uh, first of all, Ingram, who's a solid enough running back, but Lamar Jackson, and I, I'm not trying to take anything away from his arm, but he's probably the best runner in all of football. Not saying he's a running back, but just runner, period. Whether it's a wide receiver, tight end, running back, quarterback, best runner in football. And as I look at this group, even when you look at the guys who are really, really good, Miles Garrett is a great pass rusher. He's not good against the run. 
Olivier Vernon is a great pass rusher. He's not good against the run. Sheldon Richardson is solid against the run, but that's it. Ogunjobi is not. Uh, Taki Taki is, is decent enough against the run. I'm, just, I'm looking at a group that is, I mean, it's just it's kind of bad to begin with. But if it's good at anything, it's getting after the quarterback. But I, Jackson? I don't know, man. I just, that's that's kind of a, a, a deadly thing when the one thing you can do is chase quarterbacks and you got one guy that just, he lives to be chased. Like, please, please chase me. Just give me a reason to take off and run for 48 yards. So I just think that's going to be a nightmare. I don't love the wide receivers. We'll see what Hollywood Brown can do in his second year, but I also don't really love the Browns cornerbacks. You've got Ward, who seemed like he was going to be one of the top corners in football in his rookie year, kind of tapered off a little bit and lost a little bit of that excitement. I don't think they have any other corners. The safeties are are okay, right? You've got Sendejo, who's bounced around from team to team to team. Um, the other kind of unfortunate thing about Sendejo is he's kind of a versatile kind of guy. Not to say he's bad in coverage, but he's going to be kind of just sort of your your single high free safety because you got Carl Joseph over here who's going to be more of the run defense strong safety type of guy. And he might do a good job. And, you know, granted, maybe that's your one decent run defender, but that's kind of sucks when the only guy, your, your best line of defense is your safety. That's not going to be great. Um, I just think Baltimore comes in here and just starts picking apart the Cleveland Browns defense. Not to say that, that and, and, and again, a lot of this is, is matchup. You go up against a different team, and I think the Browns' defense can maybe hold up pretty well, but you've got a really solid offensive line, maybe not as much on the interior, but Brown and Stanley, where your pressure's coming from the outside, and they're they're really good defenses on the outside. You've got an extremely mobile quarterback that's going to be able to escape pressure and take off. I just don't really see a path. I I just think Baltimore is going to steamroll. And it'll be one of those things where you can I can envision the Cleveland Browns kind of hanging for a while, right? They might even take the lead. You know, they, they march down, they score, and it's like, all right, here we go. And then Baltimore, you know, whether they score or not, you, you kind of feel like there's hope. And then as Baltimore picks up momentum, and, you know, obviously the Baltimore, when you've got a 50-50 thing between the Browns offense and the Baltimore Ravens defense, you win some, you lose some, and then Baltimore gets going on offense. You know, again, Maybe through the first quarter, it's neck and neck. Maybe halfway through the second half. But by the time this game is over, it's, it's you know, we're throwing in the towel because it's just an absolute bloodbath. That's kind of how I see this playing out. So finally getting to the 3 o'clock games. Now 3 o'clock Central. That's the what I operate under. We've got the Cincinnati Bengals and the L.A. Chargers. Um, I think if there was one game that I really would struggle to watch, it would probably be this one. But it is actually kind of interesting in terms of very similar type teams that I, I kind of was going back and forth on this. But I think I've settled in on, on where I'm going. Um, probably the two worst offensive line teams in all of football. And so, for example, <laughs> you've got, and, and you know, granted you got Jonah Williams or whatever, so maybe the offensive line gets a little better for Cincinnati, but it's still a nightmare. But you got Bosa and Ingram and whatnot going up against this terrible offensive line. And then on the other side, you've got another terrible offensive line going up against Atkins and Dunlap and Reeder. Um, both of these offenses are going to have a real hard time getting going. I think the the difference for me, though, is which offense has somewhat of a shot. And when I look at the Cincinnati Bengals, as much as I, I want to get excited, and there's some potential there to get excited because they've got a couple different things. You know, you got Joe Burrow, who you want to get excited about, although, again, he hasn't had a lot of real-world experience to, to get up to speed here. But um, you've got Burrow. I'm excited about A.J. Green kind of down the line. I, I My whole thing with A.J. Green is we've never seen him be bad. We've seen him get injured. We've never seen A.J. Green just be a bad wide receiver. We're like, oh, he lost it. Now, I, granted, that's got to happen at some point. But me personally, I just want to see it first. And until I see it, he's a great wide receiver. Um, but even if he's not, you got Tyler Boyd. So there's, there's at least that. Um... And then, of course, we've got the um, the running back there and Joe Mixon, who just got paid and, and who's a multifaceted, talented running back. So there's something here. The problem is, again, I think Bosa is just going to absolutely tee off on this team. Um, I'm very curious to see how Nasir Adderley does in, in year two, which really is just going to be year one. Pretty talented guy. Um, they did add Kenneth Murray, who I think is a real talented 
uh, football player. They've got Alohi Gilman, who I don't expect much from, but he's there. But then the real big thing for me is the cornerbacks. So not only can they tee off, because that's kind of a tie, although Bosa is the best pass rusher between the two teams, but we'll call it a tie in terms of the, the defensive lines teeing off on these offensive lines and destroying these quarterbacks. But you've got cornerbacks that can hold it down. You've got Hayward, you've got King, you've got Harris. I think these guys can hold it down, even if it's advantage wide receiver. These are good enough corners to be able to handle that. Plus, you got Joe Burrow versus Tyrod Taylor. And even if Joe Burrow down the line is going to be a better long term quarterback, week one, being behind this offensive line, getting harassed by, by Joey Bosa. I just think he's going to be all up in his head, and it's just going to be—it's going to spiral pretty quickly. Whereas, if you look on the flip side, although it's still a terrible situation, you got Tyler, Tyrod Taylor, who's been around for a long time. You at least have Brian Balaga on the right side, who's got some ability. You've got all three levels in terms of having a number one wide receiver in Allen. You've got Hunter Henry at tight end. You've got Austin Eckler, who's not only a good running back but a great receiving back. So you can do a lot of different things. Plus, you have a more well-established coach who kind of knows how to utilize these pieces a little bit. And it's not as new. And I think veteranship, veterancy, veteranness um, is going to come into play a lot, as I've said now a thousand times, with the, the lack of, of practice and being able to get things implemented. The fact that the, the Bengals are so new in all this with a lot of new players and newish coaches and everything, I think that's going to play into it. So I'm, I'm going to say the Chargers win this one. Um, and I actually... Although I see it as being close, I kind of see it as one of those things where it's just, it's it's staggered the whole game. I don't see the Bengals getting going at all. And the Chargers, I think, have enough there to where I I think it's it's three points to the Chargers. I, I would probably take the Chargers in that. I think they win by more than three points. Um, just because I think they kind of get into that groove, they get into that rhythm, and they just start picking apart the Bengals, and the Bengals just kind of spiral. Again, it's just... I'm picking the Chargers, which is the most important thing, but kind of reading into it a little bit further, I think the Chargers win kind of handily because the Bengals being another team that are, are potentially a uh, first-round pick candidate, um, I don't think too many people would say that. But, again, this quarterback behind that offensive line is a disaster waiting to happen. Hopefully he can – I mean, if he can get in there and really distribute the ball quickly, Andy Dalton got the ball out extremely fast last year. They're going to need to be able to keep doing that. Uh, maybe it won't be as bad, but I could see this thing, sp the, the whole season spiraling just because they put a quarterback behind a terrible offensive line, and that's horrible. But anyways, picking the Chargers to win. This is seriously over an hour. I thought I was at like a half hour, and I just checked. That's crazy. Let me keep this concise. We're going we're gonna to do Tampa Bay and the Saints. I'll buy into the Tampa Bay hype when I see it. Um, I'm not necessarily going to believe that a really bad football team becomes a really good football team because you take a quarterback who played really poorly, who's 500 years old, you plop him in the middle of a, of a team that is not the same system that he's been running. You've got a downfield aerial assault with a guy that gets the ball out of his hand really quickly in an Earhart Perkins system, which is not what they're running in Tampa Bay. I, I don't, I can't just make that direct one-to-one. -one. Well, Tom Brady's one of the greatest to ever do it. You put him in there, boom, they're, they're going to win a Super Bowl. I don't see that. Um, beyond that, we hear all the time about how great their defense is. I don't really, I mean, it's not bad. Shaquille Barrett does a good job getting after the quarterback. You got Sue and you got Vea. Uh, you got Levante David, who's solid. Cornerbacks are not terrible. I think the safeties are really quite bad. We'll see what Antoine Winfield can do. Um, we'll see, I mean, Jordan Whitehead is not good. So, I mean, there's something. It's not an elite defense, but you can see where there's the pieces. I don't know how they stop the Saints' offense. The offensive line is dominant. Cook is a solid tight end. Breeze is one of the best quarterbacks in football. Kamara is a great running back. you got Thomas, who's a dominant uh, route-running wide receiver. And then you add Emmanuel Sanders to this. It's just Tampa Bay is not suddenly a defense that just shuts down the Saints. I don't know where in the world that comes from, but it's not. Um and that's just one side of the ball. And then you've got, again, Tom Brady, okay, cool. Evans and Godwin is is great. I'm not so sure I'm buying into the Gronk thing either. I mean, he's he retired and, and lost a bunch of weight and was out getting hammered drunk and is coming back to play with his buddy. But, again, it's a different system. It's a different coach. It's a different environment, different amount of structure. Again, it's not a bad team, and I'm, I'm not out on the fact that they're going to be a good team, but i got to see it first. I don't know that Ronald Jones is going to be able to do anything. I don't know that Brady's going to be able to work with God. I mean, is Godwin just going to run down the field and Brady's going to launch 25-yard passes to him? I, I actually think Brady and Evans can have a thing. I think that's more of a realistic thing.
But still, I, you know, you got Jenkins and Lattimore who are decent corners. You got Davenport, Davis, and Jordan up front who are just going to wreak havoc. Decent enough offensive line, but they're not going to shut this down. Um, you know, you've got Marcus Williams, who is a really, really talented safety. You got Jenkins, who's a good safety. You got Gardner Johnson, who's a good safety linebacker hybrid. I, I just, it's the Saints all day. If Tampa Bay wins, I'll be impressed. And I will start to buy into the hype, and I'll look into what happened and why it happened. Was it a fluke, or is this for real? Is this really happening? But again, I don't, I'll don't. i believe it when I see it. I'm... So moving on now to the 49ers and the Arizona Cardinals. I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat with the Cardinals as I am with Tampa Bay. I'll believe it when I see it. I don't really like the Cardinals very much. Everyone's talking about this is going to be this great division, and the Cardinals might win it, and da 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 in Seattle, and nah. I mean... I think there's a big disconnect with Kyler Murray, and I think I think I've got that one pegged. I think a lot of people play fantasy football, and he's very good in fantasy football. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's a good quarterback. It means you throw the ball like 95% of the time. I'm exaggerating, and that's going to get you more points in fantasy. If you look at, for example, PFF, he was one of the lowest graded quarterbacks in all of football, so it didn't go well. Now, is he going to get better? Maybe, but I mean. Who's running the ball? How are you running the ball behind the offensive line? I know you don't run much, but still, that's not a thing. You did add Max Williams. Cool. Maybe that's going to be a thing. I don't know. You got Hopkins. Cool. Maybe that's going to be a thing. Fitzgerald is continuing to age. I mean, he's, he's been on a downward decline since about 2015. Um, if you just look at PFF grades, 89, 83, 80, 73, 70. If, if he continues to decline, this will be his first year under 70 since 2012, and that was his only year ever being under 70. Um, the offensive line is, is not good, and you got Bosa, you got Armstead, you got Sherman, you got Mosley, you got Ward, you got Tart, you got Warner. Which of these guys you like or don't like, I don't know, but I mean, this is a, a solid established team and a very good defense. That that's I just don't know exactly how you're going to just steamroll this, and I, I don't really see a path for that. And I'd heard, well, the Cardinals give the 49ers a hard time. What, in 2018? They didn't last year. The last time they played was November 17th, Arizona 26, San Francisco 36. If we're talking about because it was close that one time when it was 28 to 25 back in October or whatever, okay, you went 0-2. And, and I don't see exactly where you get better. Obviously, if if Kyler Murray takes a massive step and, and has like a Lamar Jackson type leap yeah, of course, anything's possible. But I just think the 49ers are a better team, and, and the I'm not buying the Cardinals hype until I see it. That's just the bottom line. And it's same with the defense. Well, they added Simmons. So what? Why do I care? I don't know that Simmons is going to be good at anything. Um, you know, who else is on this team? You've got uh, Chandler Jones. That's about it. I mean, you got some other people, but, I mean, Patrick Peterson, cool. I mean, he's a big name, but he's 30 years old. He didn't have that good of a year last year. People just get stuck in these names. Like, dude, Patrick P is one of the best in the game. Dude, this isn't 2012 anymore. Um, you know, who else? Byron Murphy had a terrible year. Dre Kirkpatrick is, is not good at football. You don't have anyone else along this defensive line that I can see. Devin Kennard, give me a break. Um... Who? Who, who? who who, else are your linebackers? You don't have any other linebackers. Simmons will be playing safety half the time, linebacker half the time. You do have Buda Baker. Everyone's excited about Buda Baker. I'm not going to trash Buda Baker, but I think he's massively overrated. Um, I mean, cool. He's, I mean, he's in terms of being kind of a two-way guy who can play in coverage and, and play against the run, he's got that going for him. But as a pure coverage guy, again, if you think PFF is a joke, fine, cool. But they had him graded 48th out of 80th in terms of coverage, 27th um, of highest ranked safety. So, I mean, if he's one of the top three safeties in football, cool. I guess PFF is just the worst thing ever. Um, but it's hard to imagine they're that far off. But even if he is, so what? Who else? Because Isaiah Simmons? I mean, it's just, I don't get it, man. They, they draft Isaiah Simmons, and we assume the quarterback becomes great, and now they're just this great team. I don't know where that comes from. But yet the Green Bay Packers get no respect anywhere, and they've got pass rusher, pass rusher, pass rusher, Kenny Clark, safeties, corners, quarterback, wide receiver, offensive line, Aaron Jones, all this stuff. Oh, no, they're, they're trash. Cardinals are going to be great, though, because they got a really bad quarterback that's going to be really good. And Byron Jones is 500 years old, and they drafted Simmons. Everyone else is terrible, but, you know. Oh, and we got that wide receiver. 
who was really good back at that other team with a really good quarterback. I'm, I'm being a little bit spiteful, and I'm also just grouchy because I've been doing this for 48 hours, but um, I just I don't buy it. I think I think the 49ers are just going to smoke them. And if they don't, I'm, I'm calling it a fluke until I see otherwise. But I just, nah, I'm, I'm out. Next up, we've got the Dallas Cowboys and the L.A. Rams. And, and what started off in my mind as a pretty clear-cut win for the Dallas Cowboys, I've, I've got some question marks, um, the biggest of which is, is it really a different team than last year, which is a talented roster that can't put wins together? Um, and I think the biggest question mark for all of this, for the Dallas Cowboys in general, in terms of are they really going to take this, this again, talented roster, not the most talented, but there's more than enough here to be successful. Are they going to take this and actually go win playoffs and Super Bowls or whatever is Mike McCarthy. Um, and as a Green Bay Packers fan, I have my reservations. Um, I know Mike McCarthy took a step back, and this is beneficial for, for some te for some coaches and whatnot to take a step back and really study what the league is doing and update things, but I, I think that's sort of too much stock is put into how easy that is. These guys are really, really good at, at what they do. Mike McCarthy learned how to be a coach in the 90s, right? He was with the 49ers in the 90s, so his, his West Coast system is a much more downfield area, aerial assault kind of thing, and let me just summarize it by saying we heard the year that he got fired clearly the offense wasn't working because it's it's an outdated sort of offense and it's just not clicking maybe if you got elite players fine but anyways um he had made the comment that they had completely shredded the offensive system rebuilt it from the ground up guess what happened he trotted out the same friggin offense that we had seen for 15 years um, I'm sure there was some tweaks in terminology or whatever, but there was no drastic overhaul. There was no modernized offense. It was the same garbage we had seen forever. The same offense that defenses look at and go, yeah, we know how to beat Mike these days. So I, I'm a little hesitant to the whole, you know, he's taken a step back and, and really, um, you know, changed his approach to how he plays football offensively and whatnot. I wish him the best. I really do. I like Mike, and he's, he's he really is a brilliant guy. I just think... His way of playing football is a little outdated, and I don't think one year is enough, even for a guy like Mike, to come in and really understand the fundamentals of changing his his way of play. I mean, he, he, granted, you got guys like Andy Reid, who I think were similar, you know, old school kind of guys that were able to to catch up with the times. But um, again, I just have my reservations. But um, uh, that's one end of it. The other end is really not appreciating the Rams, which, granted, they're completely falling off. I think they're the most mismanaged team in football. The, the, the things that they're doing with contracts and whatnot are are just horrific. Um, and uh, I don't know why I'm panicking if this is recording or not. It is recording, and I have my headset on. We're good. Um, th there's still talent here, and I think one of the, the things that was overlooked, at least by me, is... You look at this offensive line, and it's a it's a critical piece to what the Rams do, right? Rams also come from that Shanahan tree. You build up the offensive line. Granted, they're a more pass-centric version of that, but they're still a, you know, outside zone kind of Shanahan kind of thing. The first thing that, that, that he did when he got there was build up this offensive line, and last year it was terrible. But you got guys like, for example, Joseph Noteboom, who was solid in his first year. He played in 2019. He played how many snaps? Just a handful before he got hurt and he was out. You got guys like Havenstein, who are really good tackles, especially in 2018, had a great year. He also was injured and missed a good por portion of the year. Um, you know, Blythe and Corbett, kind of iffy but still you bolster the offensive line Jared Goff is is good not great again we just think he's garbage because last year was a joke and he was bad before that so we've kind of written him off but he's he's capable so again build up the offensive line we got Cam Akers now in the backfield we got Goff back behind a better offensive line we got Tyler Higby who's massively underrated tight end we got Woods we got Cup we can move this offense against this defense I do think it's doable and again we flip to the other side and the biggest question isn't is this offense good enough to beat this defense because the answer is obviously yes the question is is Mike McCarthy's going to be able to to harness this you know we've got a, a team that I really think that the core of it that made it really good was a great offensive line and a running back just pounding 
behind it. The offensive line has been eroding, right? This is not the same offensive line as it was in 2015, 16, whatever it was when this was just a freakish dominant offensive line. It's not the same offensive line. We're allowing that to erode. We hire a coach that that does not care even a little bit about running the football, just wants to throw, 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 and we're drafting wide receivers. Best of luck to you, but it's just it feels like we're getting away from what worked. So obviously there's plenty of firepower here. Prescott is more than capable. Elliott is still capable behind this offensive line, even if it's not as good as it, as it was. We don't have any tight ends, but we got Cooper. We got Gallup. We got Lamb. Hopefully can still get it done. And I'm not overly impressed by the Rams' defense. Obviously Aaron Donald is going to wreak some havoc. You got a couple other people, especially at corner, that can possibly get the job done. I was a big fan of Taylor Rapp. We'll see if he can kind of take a step in his second year. Um, obviously nothing doing as far as 40 time, but elite level run defender tackler etc um again this should be pretty easy that the cowboys are going to steamroll the rams i don't know that it's necessarily the case though and again we've got kind of a newer newer coach newer scheme coming off a, a pretty bad eight and eight year um i think it was eight and eight i shouldn't be so definitive about that i feel like that's what it was um I just think there's there's potential for upset, and I shouldn't even say upset. What is the line on this? I'm, I haven't been doing a good enough job of highlighting that. So it's it's it is the Cowboys, but it's three points. So it's it's I will agree that it's close. I'm actually, you know what? I'm just gonna pick the Rams. Um, I think if you if you forced me to at gunpoint, I'd probably pick the Cowboys because it's a safer bet. But I got to do some kind of a long shotty thing here. I'm gonna say that the the Rams have enough to get it done. I think they pull off a surprise win against the Cowboys. Um, just not really being ready yet. Hopefully that doesn't send them into a tailspin where they're just like, they're giving up and they, he loses the locker room because they're just, we should have won this game or whatever. Um, they can embrace the fact that if they just really commit and, and take some time, they can get there. But I don't know. I'm, I'm buying into the, the Rams kind of resurging and the, and the Dallas Cowboys aren't necessarily just going to automatically week one going to be this powerhouse. You know, they, they got to ease into it a bit. So Call it 50-50, and I'll give it to the Rams just to add a little controversy to it. Next up, moving up into the Monday night games, we've got the Pittsburgh Steelers and the New York Giants, and we'll keep it very short. I just, you know, I saw some Giants fans trying to do their best to, to make a case for this. The Steelers' defense is for real. Um, this might be the best defensive front in football. I, I don't think I've ever seen three elite players along the defensive line, and that's where they have T.J. Watt, uh, Stephon Tuitt, and um, Cam Hayward. Now, granted, these are guys that haven't always been elite, but they all were last year. Some of these guys are regression candidates. Um, to it, you could kind of say that, but he's also been getting better every year. So it's not like he was average, 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 really good, average, average, average. He's been getting better every single year. Um, Hayward is kind of back and forth, but it's like elite, real good, elite, real good. I, you know, Again, I mean, he's 31, so he could have a somewhat of a down year. And then T.J. Watt just completely exploded. Not that he's ever really been bad, but um, he just completely exploded. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. And, and on top of all that, you got Bud Dupree, who was basically a draft bust up until last year when everything came together. Now, I, again, similar to the Bears, where you got guys that aren't that good that all of a sudden get real good, and you start to see regression, right? Hayward goes from elite to real good to it goes from elite to good. Watt, you know, same thing. Dupree goes back to being subpar, but even so, this is a great defensive front, and that's just the front. You still got Steven Nelson at corner, um, Mike Hilton and Hayden. Now, not necessarily elite, but again, good. You've got Bush going into his second year at linebacker. You got Minka, who is just, I mean, I I was out. I I wouldn't say I was out on it, but I didn't really understand why he was hyped up as much. And a lot of people are like, well, watch what happens when he gets out of Miami. You were right. I was wrong. That's top tier so i'm impressed with the giants and the fact that they're emphasizing offensive line but it's not going to be enough um evan ingram is not enough daniel jones is not enough saquon i feel sorry for him because he's not going to have very much room to run um tate and shot i mean i don't hate the giants and there are going to be weeks where i look at it and say the giants could win this game and I, I think they they could be better than what they were last year this isn't the game though it's, it's just not, and, and it just doesn't it doesn't get any better when you flip it on the other side, even if you're not sold on Ben Roethlisberger. If he's even mediocre with Connor running the ball, um, offensive line is, is beyond solid. 
You got Juju Smith-Schuster still on the team, which, you know, he had somewhat of a down year when he had no quarterback. I'm, ass I'm assuming he's going to bounce back to some degree. And what are they? Ha and who's who's going to rush the passer? Roethlisberger's going to sit in the pocket all day long. You don't have any inside linebackers. You don't have any outside linebackers. You don't have any, you know, defensive ends, whatever. Um, you don't have corners. You don't have safeties. Really, I mean, you, you don't have a defense. I'm sorry. You're getting a top five pick. You're not a very good team. You got a chance to beat somebody with with a, a good enough offensive performance, but you don't have any of the key pieces you need to be solid along the defensive line. You just are the the defense period. But you got to have at least one really good corner. Who's your one really good corner? You got to have at least somebody that can rush the passer. Who's going to rush the passer? O'Shane Zimenez? Nope. I don't think so. Not Kyler Fackrell, I can promise you that, unless he has one of his weird, freakish things like he had with the Packers where he was still a bad pass rusher, but he somehow managed to get, like, 11 sacks or whatever it was. Even so, it's not good. Jabril Peppers? Steelers win. Sorry. It is what it is. Finally, 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 we get to the Denver Broncos and the Tennessee Titans, and I cannot believe I'm about to say this, but I'm actually really excited to watch this game. Um, it's horrible, horrible news that we got about Mr. Von Miller. Um, I think that completely changes the dynamic, not just of this game, but of the Broncos season. I was really high on the Broncos. Obviously, a couple things had to go, had to break correctly for the Broncos, but I love Vic Fangio and what he was able to do with the Chicago Bears, and I feel like he was building that with the Denver Broncos. Um, you're starting to see it come to form, right? And and just losing that critical piece really changes the dynamic. Um and as I look at it now with the Broncos defense, and it can still break correctly. You know, if, if Chubb can have sort of his breakout second year because he got hurt last year, so that doesn't really count as his second year. But if he can break out, I think Boye has a real solid opportunity to become a really good corner again. I know he had that great stretch from 2016 to 2018, but kind of just didn't do much in 2019 probably because, you know, Jaguars weren't all that great and all that stuff. But also... You, you get back to doing what A.J. Boye was doing in Jacksonville back at the time um, where he was kind of just hanging back and playing more zone, which is what I think Vic Fangio is going to be having him do. He's going to be playing to his strengths a little bit more. I think Callahan is a very good underrated slot corner that Chicago underutilized. He was wise to pick them up and bring him back. So if, again, if everything goes right, if you got Chubb playing well, you got Callahan playing well, you got Boye playing well, you got Johnson at linebacker, and you've got, you know, there's a couple people in contention for best safety duo. I think this is one of them that you could put up there, the Denver Broncos with Jackson and Simmons. It's it's solid. It really is. But again, we don't know about Callahan. We don't know about Chubb. We don't know about Boye. You know, I don't, I don't know about all these things for sure. So offensively, I think I'm going to lean toward the Tennessee Titans. There's possible there's a possibility that Tannehill regresses. It is still hard to believe that he was as good as he was last year. I think some people still don't even give him credit for that. Um, but it's also possible he just finally got into a really good system that suits him where he can kind of just be a distributor that plays for a team that leans on the, the run game. Um, and he just, he kind of found his groove and is, is tearing it up. Either way, dominant offensive line. I think John o. Smith is going to take on a bigger role and, and be very capable in that. Derrick Henry is obviously the focal point of this, and they locked him up, which is wise as much as they say don't do that. That's that's the entire purpose of this offense. Not just that he's the best player necessarily, but but that's what this team does. You you, you build around Derrick Henry. Um, you got Brown, Humphreys, and Davis, which I think is actually a pretty solid trio. Obviously, A.J. Brown is a really good wide receiver, but Humphreys in the slot I think is underrated. And Davis, as much as you know, he may be gone after this year and was a big disappointment. Yeah, as a number one, but I think as a number three, opposite A.J. Brown, I think that's a solid group, and it's, it's hard. I, I mean, I could see the Denver Broncos handling it and, and doing what they need to do, but I, th I think it's going to be kind of tough um, to stop it entirely. They're going to have some, some great series, um, hopefully being able to get a little bit of pressure with Chubb and whatnot and, and being able to stop the run. They, they picked up Jarrell Casey from Tennessee, very good football player. I think Daquan Jones is, or, or excuse me, Draymond Jones. That's the other team that's Daquan Jones. Draymond Jones could potentially bring a little bit of interior pass rush. 
it's not impossible, but I'm, I'm giving the nod to the Tennessee Titans um, offense against the Denver Broncos defense. Again, put Von Miller back in there, and it changes it maybe just enough. And then you get to the other side, and, and again, there's a path because I do like Cortland Sutton. The offensive line is, is decent, not really elite. Fant could possibly take a second-year leap, obviously. Lindsey and that, that running back group that they have is, is solid. And Jerry Judy, you know, there, there's the possibility he becomes really solid. But I'm not sold on Judy. I'm not sold on Hamler if he even plays. I'm not sold on Locke necessarily. I know Broncos fans are 100% sold. He's the guy. We'll see. Fant is not a guarantee. This is another scenario where I could see this becoming something special, especially if, if Von Miller was still there. I don't see it week one against a playoff team. Uh, especially with Tennessee, you know, they, they've got Simmons, who's solid inside. You got Jadavian Clowney, who they just picked up. You got Jackson at corner. You got, you know, Byard. I mean, they've got some really good pieces on defense. I really like the Tennessee Titans. Again, I like the Broncos. I, I would have thought this would have been a really solid matchup. Um, but I, I just think there's more question marks for the Denver Broncos than there are the Tennessee Titans. Um, it's close enough that I wouldn't be surprised either way with whoever wins. I'm excited to see some of these players. I want to see how Jeffrey Simmons does. I was a big fan of him. Um, him hopefully being able to take that step. How does Clowney acclimate into this? I am the biggest K.J. Hamler fan in, in the world. I hope he plays. I want to watch him. Um, the fact that they got Judy and Hamler for the Denver Broncos, extremely exciting. I want to see what Fant does in year two. Um, you know, I want to see what Chubb does. There's, there's so many pieces that are interesting and, and why I want to watch this game. But again, I'm leaning on the Tennessee Titans because they're a more established team. They know what they're doing a little bit more. They have less question marks, less holes, and they're leaning on less um, sort of commodities that don't really have their footing quite yet. So going Tennessee Titans. Well, that's going to do it. Again, I'm planning on doing a Green Bay Packers, Minnesota Vikings breakdown as we get a little bit closer to that game. I'm not really sure what other ones I'm going to be doing. Maybe college football. They don't get a lot of play, though. But please, if you are a Packers fan, check out the Packernet podcast. Otherwise, everybody else, aside from please subscribing to this channel, liking this video, and hitting the little bell notification, be sure to check out Fan to Fan Network, where you get a lot more guys like me that are fans of their team that do breakdowns and whatnot, but it's an entire network um, that's going to be covering all the other teams. Make sure you check it out tonight. They're going to have a big old round table with a bunch of different people breaking down their teams, giving a bunch of real good insights. So be sure to check that out. Otherwise, I'll catch you next time.